Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's not quite top of the hour. I'm going to allow some time for everyone to join us from the lobby, and then we will get started. All right, it is the top of the hour, so I'll go ahead and kick us off today. Welcome to the Rural Health Executive Educational Series. I am Cody Smith, the Partnership Manager with the NRHA Service Corporation, and I'll be serving as your moderator for today's presentation. Please note there is a short survey at the end of this session, and if you could take just a moment to fill that out, I'd truly appreciate it. Uh, your feedback is invaluable in helping us to refine and tailor our future series to best serve your needs. Few housekeeping items to go over just to get us started today. All attendees are muted during the session. This does help to avoid background noise. We do aim to wrap up the presentation in about 45 minutes. That'll leave some time at the end for questions and answers. Um, if you have a question at any time for our presenter, please go ahead and put it into the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel, and I'll be sure that we address it at the end. Um, I'd also like to remind you that this event is being recorded and you'll receive an email with a link to the recording tomorrow. Uh, today, we have the privilege of hearing from John Downs, Principal of Stroudwater Associates. John is presenting Evaluating Facilities Needs Through a Strategic Lens. Uh, before we do begin, though, I would like to extend our sincere thanks to our dedicated partner, Stroudwater, Stroudwater Associates. We are so grateful for your continued support and industry expertise, which allows us to host conferences such as our upcoming conference in September, Critical Access Hospital Conference, and presentations like what we're listening to today. Um, your support is crucial to our mission of advancing rural health initiatives. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to John. Uh, John, thank you for joining us. I know this is our second in a three-part series. So um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us for the series. Awesome. Thanks so much, Cody. And I am going to kick off. I'm hoping everyone can see the screens OK. And certainly, as Cody mentioned, uh, feel free to put in any questions that you have as we go through into the uh, chat box. Uh, I won't look at them as I go through because I'm just too distracted that way. Uh, but Cody will read them at the end and we'll make sure we get through all of them. Uh, certainly at the very end, I've also included my uh, contact information. And while I know Cody will send out an audio recording of this presentation, if anyone is interested in the slides themselves, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to send those over to you. So today we're gonna to talk about evaluating facility needs through a strategic lens. Uh, just a little bit of context. Uh, my name is John Downs and I've been a principal at Stroudwater since 2009. Prior to that, I was a principal in an architectural firm based in Boston uh, for 14 years. And my focus has really been uh, on three things. One is the underlying market analysis that drives you know, most of what all of us do. Uh, two is strategic planning. That's what I spoke about uh, just a couple of weeks ago on one of these sessions. And then the third, and we'll talk about that today, is master facility planning. And having come from an architectural firm, we certainly did quite a bit of that for healthcare institutions. I am not an architect by training. Uh, I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Uh, the backstory was that I was doing an undergrad in psychology and the folks at the architectural firm thought that I would be a good person to help wrangle their staff and communicate with their clinical clients. Uh, outside of work, I am addicted to golf, uh, not unhealthily, but uh, it's bordering there. Uh, so if the weather is good, I would love to be out on the golf course and I really do like gourmet cooking. Uh, so goals for the series, uh, we talked about strategic planning back on the 15th. Today we'll talk about looking at the facility needs of an organization through a strategic lens. How does facility master planning really work? And then tomorrow my colleague Brian Hoppola will talk about how you plan and execute strategic facility investments from a dollar's perspective. How do you go about getting the funding to make your facility a reality? Uh, so you know, really the three parts together kind of start with understanding the market, go to understanding your facility, and finally really figuring out how you can execute on that uh, with actual dollars from the market. But so let's talk about today. Uh, what is the approach that I would ideally say everyone should look at to facility master planning? It starts with understanding the current and future underlying market demand 
for healthcare services. Anyone that was in the session that we did a couple of weeks ago, you know, we spent quite a bit of time talking strategically about differentiating between kind of what I want versus what the market needs, understanding who else is providing services in the market, and all of those things drive to what it is that we need to provide from a facility perspective. The next step is evaluating your existing facility assets and the need for phased investment or replacement. You know, back maybe as early as five years ago, uh, but certainly if I go back 10 years ago, folks were looking at their facilities and saying, yep, this critical access hospital is really old, we're going to replace it. And so, you know, we've got a replacement study that's got 120 or 40 uh, hospitals that have gone through replacements over the last several years. In the last couple of years, unfortunately, both with the escalation of construction costs as well as the escalation of interest rates, we've really seen folks look at these facility replacements and say, you know, what all of my friends were, you know, replacing their hospital for 20, 30, 40 million dollars a couple of years ago. Now we're looking at, you know, 80, 90, 100 million dollars and more, even for relatively small critical access hospitals. Uh, so sometimes a replacement isn't the way that we can go. We have to think about a phased investment. How do I invest something today that sets me up for the long term? Third issue is identifying the major campus issues. You know, what's the need that has to be scratched today? What are the things that are making us most stressed? And can we address those while also maintaining the flexibility to address other issues in the future? Uh, as, um, as critical access hospitals, as rural providers, one of the things that we cannot do is waste money. And one of the easiest areas to waste something in is to build a facility that is in the wrong spot and has to be taken down. I'll share an example of that uh, in just a little while uh, from when I first joined Stroudwater 14, 15 years ago um, with a client uh, and something, you know, hilarity ensued, certainly. Um, and then finally, ensuring a financial, financially sustainable entity by modeling the actual volume changes we anticipate the cost of the facility investments and any operational changes that we might have through the Medicare cost report. Again, rural doesn't mean we have a critical access hospital. Not everything is going to be cost-based reimbursed. Different states are going to give us different amounts on our Medicaid program versus the Medicare cost report. But it is important to understand everything that we're doing, how it flows through today and tomorrow's payment system, because those things sometimes help us you know, to get into a position to make an investment where a traditional PPS hospital might not be able to do it because they don't have any of that cost-based reimbursement. So making sure that whatever we do is financially sustainable uh, is key. It's been rare, but we have had to go out to some clients over the last couple of years that have overextended, uh, built facilities that they couldn't afford, built things that were much more based on wants rather than needs, and the market wasn't there to sustain that. And so, you know, those folks end up having, you know, bond write downs and things like that, which just no, it's not good for anyone. So I'm going to talk today in two ways. Uh, when I talk about the big picture of master facility planning, you know, that's kind of talking about starting from today, understanding what we have, understanding what we need, and then developing a plan for that. Uh, there's traditional master facility planning, the way that many of you may have done this in the past, certainly the way that I did that inside of an architectural firm, firm uh, versus something that we call charrette master facility planning. And lots of folks use the term charrette. Uh, it actually comes from, uh, you know, way back when uh, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, when all of the architects were on the back of these carts, and charrette is another word, is a French word for cart. And so they're on the back of the carts. They have to submit their drawings to their professor by, you know, X period of time. And architects, as they're known to do, are trying to finish those things up at the last minute. So they're out there sketching, sketching, sketching. And so the idea of a charrette became this kind of intensive design exercise where we try to accomplish things in a short period of time with lots of effort. Uh, and so we've kind of stolen that as we think of facility master planning to say, is there a way to do that that's different than the traditional three to six months and we're doing that in four to six weeks? Uh, what's the difference in focus? You know, traditional master plan, I remember doing many of them inside of the architectural firm and we would be as concerned that biomedical engineering needed an extra 123 square feet as we were that the emergency department needed to be expanded and relocated. And, you know, I think in a charrette, we look at that and say, 
let's make sure we understand the critical departments and we'll figure out the rest. It's not to say that they're not important, but it is absolutely to say they're not as important as making sure we get the critical departments right. The third difference is in engagement. Uh, the three to six month process is often consultant comes on site, talks to the client, you know, you have some discussion, have some ideas, consultant goes back, the architect goes back, they draw up some things, they come back in three weeks, they show you again, you have some more discussion, they go back, they edit it. It's very sporadic in terms of the engagement versus a focused engagement. We are going to start today, we are going to finish on Friday, that's how we're going to get this done, and everyone is all hands on deck as we get that through. Uh, the fourth major difference is in output, uh, and I would say, you know, it's not to say a traditional master facility plan wouldn't have a prioritized plan of action, but all too often what I see is when we spend three or six months doing a master plan, you create a very nice, very thick book that sits on the shelf of the executives and then six months, six years later, they call up to do the next version of a master plan. Maybe they've executed a project, maybe they have not, but oftentimes they will provide me with a whole stack of these really, really nice books that were comprehensive. They have great information. We're able to take information from there to create the Charette master facility plan, but it wasn't a prioritized plan of action. It wasn't something that said, I know what I need. I understand how to afford it. I'll talk to someone that can help me finance that and we can execute it the next week, the next month, the next year, rather than spreading that out. We'll talk a little bit today, a little more about the Charette master facility planning process. Uh, so the timeline of a Charette, uh, it's about a month to build the underlying market analysis, the baseline facility drawings, develop an initial financial model. It's important to have all of that done before you get into doing master facility planning. Because if we don't understand what we can afford, if we don't understand what is there, you can't possibly do this inside of a week. But if you've done all of that baseline, now you can get on site and in an intensive week, work with clients, work with the administrative team, work with your providers, work with your board to develop volume scenarios. What does the market look like and what do we think it will be 10 years from now? What is our facility today and what solutions or what modifications might need to be made in order to accommodate some of those volumes? And what would happen if we did that? If we're successful, how does the financial modeling look? Are we able to pencil out the cost of this project with the impact that we see from the Medicare cost report or from other financial instruments so that we know this is actually a viable project? The last thing we want to do the last thing I would imagine any of you want to do is go through a process, get your staff excited that something is going to happen only to find out it can't happen because you can't afford it. Uh, there's a story years and years ago, uh, went down to see a client in Louisiana. That client in Louisiana said, you know, we really want you to do a strategic plan and then we'd like you to do a master facility plan. So we did the strategic plan. We looked at the finances, said, Finances don't look so good. We'd expect them to be better based on A and B and C in your particular market and understanding the volumes. And sure enough, as we looked into it, there was no way to afford any kind of a master facility plan. You know, they had an architect tell them, sure, you can do this and this and this, and it's going to be X million dollars for a replacement hospital. But that hospital didn't have windows, didn't have a roof, didn't have a whole bunch of other things. And suddenly it went from 30 million to 70 million uh, in cost. But it didn't matter because they couldn't afford 30 million. So they had spent a whole bunch of time, staff got really excited about spending all this money getting a new hospital, and it turned out that they couldn't afford much more than a minor renovation. Well, we looked at the finances and realized there were some challenges in their revenue cycle, and were able to pull those things together so that they then were starting to make money. This particular client is now on phase two of a three-phase replacement project on their campus. Once we understood what they needed to do from a financial and revenue cycle perspective, they were then able to execute on their facility plan. They were not able to execute on a replacement hospital. That was not going to happen. It needed to be incremental. So part of the plan was how could we look at their campus and make it something that could eventually get their ultimate goal, but in the short term, work them towards that without doing something or putting something in the way of their success. And once we have a semifinal deliverable at the end of the week, 
there's an exit presentation and oftentimes uh, a final report two to three weeks after that, just based on some edits that might need to get made. So what's an overview of the process? Involve multidisciplinary stakeholders in a rapid process. We need to have people, not just the administrative team. It can't just be the CEO and the facilities director. It's got to be multidisciplinary. We need to understand the perspective of the medical staff. We need to understand the perspective of the board and community members we need to understand the perspectives of those that are going to be executing the particular facility issues. Uh, identify, identify the priorities of the organization and the financial abilities. What can we do today? Are we just on a fool's errand and we have to make operational changes before we can make uh, facility investments? Or do we have the ability today to do something and it's important to identify what those priorities might be? Understand, if we've done the strategic planning that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, then we already understand the market needs. If we've not done it yet, now is the time to make sure that we do that because we have to understand needs versus what someone says, oh, I would like or I want to offer X, Y, and Z service. Every client I go to, we all want to offer surgery. We all want to offer medical oncology. These are things that our community wants to have close to home. But if our market isn't large enough to do that, if we don't have the providers to do that, it doesn't matter what kind of space we create. So we've got to understand those needs. We evaluate the short and the long-term options. How can we look at something that says, you know, you may not be able to afford 20, 30, 40, pick your number of millions of dollars in terms of projects today. You can afford $6 million. Well, that $6 million, I hope, is the first step towards the 20, 30, 40, 60 million dollar project that you might need over a long term. How do we make sure that whatever we do today is moving in that right direction? Track things. Can we fast track immediate projects? And I have a specific example that I'll share at the end of today's presentation, looking at, you know, hey, we've got some CARES funding, we've got to use it or lose it. How do we do that? But we also want to do it in the context of a master plan. Develop a long range framework that has phased investments. Again, we know we're not going to, most of us are not able to do a wholesale replacement of our hospital. Those that can, you know, that either have tons of cash they're sitting on, fantastic donor bases, or they're very, very uh, cost-based reimbursement and are able to do that, you know, that's great. Most folks are not. So we need some phased projects in order to get that to happen. And then finally, we understood early on what our financial abilities were. We identified those. Now we've got to build out a pro forma financial model, including the cost report impact. Because as we think about the future, we are different. Those of us that are critical access hospitals are different than PPS hospitals making the same kind of investment. If we had a like PPS hospital in terms of whatever you want it to be, net patient revenue, reimbursement, you know, or not reimbursement, net patient revenue, volumes, cash, all of those types of things, if they're not cost-based reimbursement, cost-based reimbursed, they are going to look very different in terms of what they're able to afford versus what you're able to afford as critical access hospitals with cost-based reimbursement. So why do we choose to use a charrette process instead of a traditional long three to six month uh, piece? Uh, one is the efficient use of time. Uh, it is more efficient for a client to have a consultant come out for fewer hours than longer hours, just because if we think about something in terms of billing by the hour, it's certainly better to do that shorter. Uh, but more important than that is it's a more efficient use of your time. It's a more efficient use of your staff's time, of your medical staff, of your board. Being able to get in, get an answer, and get out inside of a week lets folks focus on that in order to get that long range vision. We focus on it today so we don't have to think about planning two weeks from now, we can think about executing two weeks from now. The charrette provides a long range vision and it provides that quickly. It's integrating strategy and operations with the financial realities of your organization. Quickly get to no regret moves. If we have to invest in a rural health clinic and it has to be on our campus or it has to be within 250 yards of our campus for one reason, HOPD or another, we may be able to do that earlier on in the process and say, great, this area of the campus would be great for an ambulatory development. We can put that into this spot 
and it can go forward even while you're planning other phases of your implementation. So we can prioritize those initial needs with phased implementation plans. And then finally, you know, one of the keys that I like in terms of our process of providing master facility planning or charrette master facility planning is separating out uh, the independence of the advice. Uh, you know, I don't get compensated on the value of uh, construction cost for a particular project. You know, it's a, here's the fee, this is the fee to do the work. It's not something where we're looking necessarily at, um, or at all, at how much a project is. If I tell you I only have $20 million to do a project, and I'm not, in, and I'm incented by the fact of getting 20 million or saying, you know, you really don't have to do that project. You should hold off and do something in two years when you can afford 25 million. Uh, some folks might choose to go for that $20 million project because their incentives are based on a percentage of that construction value. I think having that independence, taking it away from those that may benefit from a decision to go forward or not go forward uh, is a better approach. Uh, there are lots of roles that have to get played when we're going through master facility planning. There's certainly your internal team. You know, I think that's the, the C-suite, absolutely. It's oftentimes the facilities director gets plugged into that and then perhaps some folks from the finance side. Uh, but then there's the external stuff. There's the planning team, you know, the folks that are helping to understand the market, understand the demand, understand what the facility need might be. There's the design team, the architects and the engineers that actually execute the project, develop the building plans. Then it goes to the construction team. Those are the folks that are building it and the financing team in order to get that project funded. Not all of us have just cash sitting around that we can pay for the entirety of a project. And so, you know, the, the key as we think about all of these team members is that there is no beginning and there is no end. They're all kind of involved as we go through this process. It's making sure that the team members you're bringing to help your organization are all focusing on the thing most important to you that they can do. Financing is helping you find the best options. The planning team is helping you find the best solution from a market demand perspective. The design team is executing a building that will stand for a long period of time, and the construction team is implementing those types of things. All of those roles wanna be thinking about early on in the process. Another key is incorporating the broad perspectives. I mentioned before, this cannot just be senior management. This has to be senior management. It has to be the medical staff, the board, even the community and departmental leadership. We went through an effort uh, with a client up in Wyoming uh, and basically just said, okay, well, you know, let's just have a round robin. We'll just start talking about some things and then try to organize those things. And they organized into, you know, what are the big issues we've got in our diagnostic and treatment areas? What about our clinic spaces? We need meeting in group spaces, staff support, infrastructure, general support, site issues, different perspectives, different folks. The medical staff had a lot more to say about the clinic and the diagnostic treatment area than they did on the site and parking area. The board and the community were hearing all about meetings and groups, uh, general support issues, and the site and parking. And the departmental leadership are saying, hey, we're planning on hiring these six people and I have no offices for them. I've got no staff support to be able to help those folks out. Early on in a process, bringing those broad perspectives gets us better information to go forward from. For those folks that saw the presentation on strategic planning a couple of weeks ago, uh, and if you didn't, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to send that along as well. Uh, there are four key levers of demand modeling. I don't care if you're a critical access hospital, if you're an individual uh, practice, or if you're an academic medical center, these same four things drive the need for services, equipment, rooms inside of your market. It starts with the population. You know, who are we serving? Where are we serving them? The rate at which they utilize those services. Are they going up or down, inpatient versus outpatient? Does insurance have something to do there? The third lever is our market share. What piece of that market do we want? Some things we may say, you know what? I'm a critical access hospital. I am not much interested in the cardiac surgery and the neurosurgical market. I'm gonna take 0% market share on there, but I sure want 100% of the pneumonia patients. And I want all of the lower acuity cardiology patients because I feel it's important to keep those folks close to home. 
orthopedic surgery, maybe I've got an orthopod and I'm thinking of getting into that. And I think I can offer it better than the larger hospital that's in the urban area. So I'm gonna fight for market share there. Market share is where we begin to have a little bit more of a lever in terms of our control. The final lever is throughput. We have the most control over that. The issues of how many days a week are we open? How many hours a day? How fast can we push someone through? All of those decisions drive the number of rooms that we need to have in order to provide the volumes that our community is demanding. So we start by understanding the service area. And again, some of this is repetitive for those that have seen the strategic planning piece, but we need to understand the geography we're serving and then the volumes within that geography. It's also important to understand the geography. And if I think about a primary service area, a secondary service area, or a competitive service area, not have those geographies overlap. I want to have individual geographies so that I can look. One, one piece of volume is not duplicated elsewhere. We're all gonna fight for that same one piece of volume. Once I understand the service area I'm providing care for, then I have to understand what's happening inside of it. And that starts with the demographics. What's the age breakdown? You know, I've got age groups, zero to 17, 18 to 44. Okay, with those two, if I've got growth in those areas, I may need to be thinking about my obstetrics program. I may need to think about my pediatrics program. Well, if I don't have any growth in those areas and this particular client, they've got a market of 21,600 people, the 18 to 44 is growing by 3.6% over five years. That's not a huge amount of growth that we've got to be thinking about relative to obstetrics. 65 plus age cohort really projected to grow substantially 15.3% over the next five years. And those are the folks that utilize healthcare services more frequently. So we've got to be able to think about what services might we need to offer, what volumes will likely be in our market if that's the population we're trying to serve. We can then start looking specifically for that geography, what's projected to happen on an inpatient basis. How does that break out by service line? Cardiology, orthopedics, pulmonary, general medicine, so on and so forth. If we pulled out things that we don't provide today and don't intend to provide tomorrow, then these current number of discharges projected numbers and current days all change. And it gives us a sense as to in our market, put a big fence around our service area and said, nobody gets in, nobody gets out. What would we need to provide for 100% market share? That's our starting point. Everything else goes down from there, but we know we're never going to need to provide more than that because the volume doesn't exist inside of our market. So it's important to have a good source of data to be able to pull this from. We typically use Meritive, uh, previously IBM Watson, before that it was Thomson Reuters, and before that it's too many names to even remember. But making sure that you've got good data to make decisions with is very, very key. Oops, wrong direction. Uh, on the outpatient side, it's the same type of a thing. This is that same geography, the basket of services for outpatient, 551,000 things projected to grow up by you know, quite a bit to 610,000 things, a growth of 10% over that same five-year period. So inpatient going down seven plus percent, outpatient going up 10%, but then it breaks down into individual services. And it's important for us to think about what is the volume in the market and what type of facility response do I need in order to make that happen? So we start looking at your actual volumes. So we take from the previous slide, we would look at, let's say, ED and some of the imaging modalities, uh, outpatient GI, outpatient surgery, and inpatient surgery. We can look at what the estimate is inside of the primary service area. That calculates to a use rate per thousand, that utilization number. Uh, another important piece is to look at what, p what percentage of your volume comes from this primary service area. Most states have really, really bad outpatient uh, all-payer data. Uh, we've got sometimes reasonable inpatient all-payer data, but most of the time, if I call the State Hospital Association and I try to get some data, uh, it might say, here's the volume of X, Y, and Z, and here's you know your volume of that, but does that include physician practices? Does it not include physician practices? Does it include private centers? Does it not include private centers? One of the ways that we've been able to look at that or to try to come up with a proxy 
is to take what we believe is the estimate for that primary service area, and then from your actual data, do a patient origin study. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Do a patient origin study to understand that 80%, 90%, 23%, whatever it might be, comes from, of your actual volume, comes from your primary service area. So once we know the zip codes, we compare that to what you're actually doing, and we're able to then adjust the size of the market. So in this particular example, 7,252 expected ED visits in the primary service area, if 80% of our volume came from that primary service area, then we could say that the ED would actually be around 9,000 in terms of estimated adjusted market because we know that 20% of our patients are coming in from someplace else. We also look at the narrative data relative to five-year projected growth, and then we annualize that because especially when you're thinking of facility planning, a five-year growth projection isn't going to be enough. I'm not going to be able to give anyone precision 10 years out from now, but at least we can try to be directionally correct. So we may look at these five-year numbers, turn those into annual numbers, and then use that as a 10-year projected number so that we can at least have some sense kind of directionally where the market looks like it might be 10 years from now. The reason five years isn't enough is if we do a master plan this year and it takes us you know, a year to design something and two years to build something, or it takes you and your architectural team a year to design and two years to build, then that's three plus years out from today. And suddenly we're already at the end of what this five-year growth number is. So starting to look at that out to the future is a little bit better. <clears throat> we look at that same adjusted market size, compare that against your historical volumes, to give us a sense as to what are we capturing today. Again, this is a theoretical market share because we don't quite know, you know was the 20% that you're getting from outside of your service area the same that someone else might be getting from outside of their service area, but it gives us some level of directionality. And it lets us understand if I'm already capturing 92% of the expected CT scan volume, there isn't a ton more from a market share perspective. Maybe I can capture it on a utilization change, but market share I'm already capturing. But when I look at GI services, and I'm going from 705 that I captured out of an expected 1400, there's 50% that I'm not yet getting. And is there an opportunity for me to get that? We then look at the throughput. Again, I mentioned this was the area that you're able to control more than anything else. Uh, so it is all about the key factors, the hours per day that you're open, the days per year, the visit length, how long are folks in the facility for at any given time, how efficient can we be with getting folks in and out and cleaning and turnover and all of those types of things, and able to give us something called visits per room per year. And sometimes we just set a benchmark number that says ED is 1,250 visits per room per year. Other times we use a mathematical calculation, you know, 1,800 uh, GI procedures per room per year, 933 outpatient surgeries per room per year, 700 inpatient surgeries, all driven by the fact that in surgery, these are all eight hours per day, 250 days a year. So we're assuming not working on the weekends, GI at 45 minutes, outpatient surgery at 90, inpatient at 120, and a 70% efficiency factor so we can capture turnaround time, things like that. Calculates a visits per room per year, which then if we divide the expected market or the adjusted market size by those visits per room per year, it gives us a baseline number of, of rooms that we may need. And then we round those up because, you know, you certainly don't want to be the person that gets, you know, half an ultrasound or, you know, half an outpatient surgery. They just do the first part. They don't, they leave the equipment in there and you just move on. Now, so you always want to round up. But when we look at something like that, we may say, okay, well, GI, the entire market is 1,400 cases. And if we could do 1,800 per year, that says we need three quarters of a room. We're going to round that up to one. Could we round it down in some way? Well, it can't go below one, but if it was 1.2, we might be able to change some of our uh, throughput assumptions so that we could get away with 1.2 or figure out ways to be flexible between GI and outpatient surgery. We then start to think about what the future might look like in terms of scenario modeling. So we go back to those original narrative annual growth numbers. 
We project that out to 2034 to understand what a market volume might look like in 2034. We then can look at your historical market share and compare that historical market share to what the 2034 market might look like and say, okay, if we had the same share, but of a different sized market, what would be our volume number? And then look at a couple of other scenarios. I've just narrowed it to these four, A, B, D, and F. But one says, I don't care what Meritiv thinks is going to happen. We're just going to grow by 1%. Another says, I believe that we're going to do whatever Meritiv says. We'll go up and down as all boats rise or all boats fall. But we're also going to capture additional market share, maybe four points of share, maybe eight points in share. And this is where the conversation between the administrative team, the providers, the finance folks, the consulting team, to really look at that and say, is there a facility difference if I did 7,434 ED treatments per year versus 7,044? Well, if I go back to the previous slide, I was dividing my expected volume by 1,250. If I divide either of these by 1,250, do I come up with a similar number? Is it a fractional change? And now I've got a decision to make in terms of where am I making that investment? Am I going to build a little bit extra? I'm not going to build shell space because that's bad on the cost report, but am I going to build something that might be a conference room that could turn in the ED that happens to have gases in the wall that could turn into that next treatment space? Those are the kinds of things in master planning that we want to start thinking about. So we've thought about the volumes, we've thought about the opportunities, now we've got to think about the actual physical site. So we start by understanding who owns what around our site. This particular client, they owned all of the areas in blue, they had some nice landscaping across the front side and then it bordered a neighborhood in the back side. So we wanna understand really early on, okay, well that neighbor really has a property that kind of cuts into your, if you can see my cursor moving around, cuts into your site. That might be a challenge as we look to expand or to change over time. Maybe we can do something else on the other side, but let's understand a little bit more about what they have. They've got you know three primary constructions and then a little tiny addition, but their initial building was in 1985. They built a nursing home in 1992 and a clinic addition in 2016. Now, when I started in this and, you know, from being from New England, I've got lots of clients where, you know, they're uh, still in buildings from the early 1900s. Uh, they're not necessarily doing clinical things, although we did have a client convert a 1911 building to a linear accelerator uh, in New York State. And that was pretty interesting. But uh, a 1985 building, while it sounds relatively new, sounds relatively young, is 39 years old. So that probably made a whole bunch of us on the call feel really old. Um, you know, I think about what I was doing in 1985 and uh, it's a long, long time ago. So we've got to understand what the building age is and what makes sense for us to invest over time. Looking at development opportunities, where does the existing site, again, assuming that we can't afford to replace and go wherever we might go, where are there even opportunities for us to expand? On this particular campus, it became these dark blue boxes that were the areas where there was even an opportunity to expand without relocating everything, without saying, okay, we're, we're going to get rid of the nursing home and we're going to expand out to that side. The next key piece, and it's really, really critical, is to understand adjacencies. And I'll talk a little bit about this in a second, but understanding those adjacencies and how can we improve them over time. We're not going to solve everything tomorrow. This particular client, and I'll show this in a second, if we think about the yellow on here, the yellow areas are the kind of public circulation. Well, in order for any patient to go from this emergency department, they needed to cross that yellow car corridor of public circulation to get to these red inpatient beds on the other side. And so that meant every single time someone was going, they were crossing that public corridor. That's something we'd like to see changed. Thinking about all of the various adjacencies, support services, clinical services, inpatient services, and how we can make those better is part of master facility planning. Then we set a long-term site vision. Okay, we knew earlier on that the only areas we could really expand were kind of out in these powder blue showing areas now, a little bit to the south, a little bit to the east, 
and then an addition if needed for the nursing home out to the west over the long term. But it's really important as you're doing a master facility plan, even if you know that you only want to do one small thing today to develop a long range plan. It's critical to avoid or just be careful scratching today's itch. I said I was gonna give this example. We had a client that you know really felt like they needed to scratch today's itch uh, and they went and built a parking garage. Uh, it was a client, it was before Stroudwater was involved with them. They were a larger PPS hospital, uh, got on site to do a master facility plan. Their big issue was the emergency department. And they said, that's great. Uh, you know, how could you fix it? I said, well, we just have to, if you can get rid of this parking garage, the ED expands right here. And then we found out that they had just opened it three months prior. Uh, those are the kinds of things when someone is scratching today's itch, we really have to make sure it's not going to turn into something worse tomorrow. Uh, what are my facility assets today? Where do I have you know, assets? Are they on campus? Are they off campus? Can something leave the campus so I don't need to expand here? Uh, always asking yourself, what will today's project do to my future flexibility? If I need to expand my primary care clinic, does that prevent me from expanding my ED later when I can afford to do a larger project? And the most important thing when doing a long range plan is actually where must I not do something? What areas must be held sacred for the eventual solution? That is absolutely critical to ask in a master plan. You think about adjacencies inside of a master plan, you know, uh, inside of a critical access or a smaller rural hospital, there are often three entrances, kind of the ED, the main entrance, the support or back of the house entrance. Sometimes those get a little bit conflicted. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, there are only two out of those three. Uh, but the ED is certainly the epicenter of most of our organizations. Most everything has to touch it. I may have to get from the ED to beds. I may have to get from the ED to imaging. I may, if I offer surgery, I may have to get to surgery. I certainly need to to support the ED uh, from back of the house, but we can't afford to duplicate things. So we've got to minimize that duplication. Try to think about back of the house, front of the house. If I'm on a stretcher, I would rather not have someone in street clothes that's from the community walking by and seeing me. Once I'm in an x-ray room, that's less of an issue. But when I'm out in the corridor, can we separate those two types of things by minimizing some of that cross traffic? Again, I recognize it's difficult to eliminate it entirely, but in a master plan, if you identify it, you might have opportunities to decrease some of that traffic. Um, <clears throat> so recent example uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, the ED for this particular client was a major issue. Uh, they said, hey, we've got to get more ED treatment space. We need to improve the flow. We've got CARES funding. We have to use it or lose it. Uh, so we can't spend six months designing this so that we can go forward. So we said, okay, let's do a charrette master facility plan. We'll fast track, we'll fast track the charrette and understand what has to happen there. So the first piece was we knew that that ED I mentioned earlier, the ED to the beds was a challenge. We wanted to look at that a little bit differently. So we said, well, what if beds someday were to move down to the south? Well, if the beds move to the south, then we would design the ED in a different way than if you just expanded it out in the hatched area that is shown here. We have to understand how would we connect into a future building? Could we do that? Could we design an ED expansion today so it wouldn't be disrupted tomorrow, but most importantly for this client, it was also identifying where it says future MS Swing 13, that area became sacred. Nothing else could go there because it was where they would solve their beds long-term. They looked at a phased investment project. They did that ED project right away with CARES funding. Then based on the master plan, there were a couple of other areas that they could do as cash became available a kitchen project, a lab project, a surgery project. They were in the right spots for the services. They weren't going to impact other things that were needed. And then how could we do those as dollars became available? And then finally, the longer term building additions when needed, right now they didn't need new inpatient beds. They didn't need additional clinic capacity, but they've got the ability to go and do that later in the future. They've got that master plan. It's critical though, as you're going through all of that to make sure that we have a financially sustainable plan. I've mentioned a couple of times that I am not the finance person at Stroudwater, uh, but building through 
the cost report impact of a facility master plan if you are a critical access hospital is absolutely critical. It's often that you'll be able to afford something your PPS colleagues cannot afford. Financial reserves, you know, do we have days cash on hand to be able to meet lending covenants? You know, or do we have to work on that first before we can go ahead uh, and go forward with a facility project? Uh, but a master plan also gives us an opportunity to do fundraising with a vision. Uh, even in communities where there isn't a ton of donor money, there's often more than we know. And those folks are very, very particular about, excuse me, about where they're going to spend their resources. One of the things I've said it before and I'll say it again, is donors and foundation folks like to bet on the winning horse. They don't want to bet on you know, a horse that may, may not make it through the race. And you all as critical access CEOs, CFOs, executive teams, providers, consultants, everyone that's on the call are key in keeping healthcare rural. We've got to keep the hospitals survivable. And so not overextending ourselves, not trying to do a project that isn't in line with a vision and isn't in line with financial reality, you know, that's all of our responsibilities. Once we've got all of that, then we can look at debt capacity and say, yes, we know that we'll be able to pay back this debt. We're not going to get you know, called by the bond or USDA will have to come in and rescue this or not be able to fund this and you know, the hospital closes. That's not good for the people that rely on you to get their health care provided. When we're doing master planning, it is absolutely the time for conservative budgeting. I will not spend a lot of time on this except to say a couple of key things. One, it is critical to be realistic about construction cost per square foot. Talk to your local builders, talk to your architects, talk to folks that are in those trades because the person you don't want to talk to is the one that did the hospital replacement six years ago and they got their stuff into modern healthcare and they talk about, I built a $23 million, 22 bed replacement critical access hospital. That's not happening anymore, not at all. So don't use old information to try to solve your current issues. Be realistic because the last thing you wanna do is think something's gonna be $20 million and it suddenly comes up to 52. That's construction cost per square foot. The second one is don't forget about the other things. You want lights, you want air, you want equipment, all of the soft costs, the permitting, the architectural fees, all of those things also add up. So in this particular example, $35 million of the building was construction, 8 million was fixtures, furniture, and equipment, and then almost 9 million was other stuff, fees architectural fees, contingencies, whatever it may be. The last thing I'll point out here is that it's important when you think about the amount of square footage that you need, there are three different types of square feet. There's usable square feet or net square feet. That's the stuff that you see inside of the four walls that you sit in right now. There is departmental gross square feet, which includes the thickness of your wall to the next room over, as well as the corridor out in front of you, and even some basic infrastructure inside of your department. And then there's building gross square feet, the exterior thickness of the wall, elevators, stairs, major mechanical spaces, corridors that go between departments. All of that has to get paid for when you're thinking about facility master planning. So it's important to make sure we're always talking about the same numbers. When we think about a debt scenario, looking at a total project cost and understanding what piece of that you may be able to contribute directly in, what would be the resulting debt? And certainly Brian will be able to talk a little bit more about this tomorrow, but building that out at a high level and understanding over a 35 year lending period with 24% cost-based reimbursement broken out with this type of a depreciation factor, how could that impact us? What will our debt service coverage ratio look like? What if we did some of these improvements from either operations or cost report improvements? that we may have looked at earlier on in the process. What if those, and this is where you would get to an exam level financial feasibility, the accountant may look at that and say, that's brilliant that you think you're going to get $540,000 from Better 340B implementation to help fund this project. What if that went away? Is your project still viable? It's important to understand what that impact is going to look like. So finally, 
you know, we think about where it goes next time when Brian talks tomorrow uh, for capital planning, where does the money come from? Not just for the facility planning, but you'll have other capital needs going forward. When do you need to start your capital process? What is a capital process comprised of? How do you use local banks or work with programs like the USDA? So, you know, for my purposes today, that's what I've got to share. I'd love to take any questions that that anyone has and we'll happily send uh, slides over as needed. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, um, I put in the chat to go ahead and put your questions into the control panel anytime. We'll make sure we address them. I've got a couple I'll hit here. Don't forget the recording will come out um, tomorrow afternoon. So first question, how would you recommend forecasting services that the organization does not provide now? Especially how to start thinking about other potential community health services to add to your organization. This is a long one, sorry. I might have to send this one to you, John. Uh, no, so far I got it, so far I'm good. Okay, <laughs> um, how to other potential community health services to add to your organization, organization such as mental health, dental health, care coordination, care management services, et cetera. Thank you, Chris. Sure, so I mean, that's a, it's a fantastic question. I think the, to start, is to try to put some quantification as to forget about whether you're doing it but in your community how much of that care is being delivered and so you know whether it's dental or it's behavioral health or whatever uh, it may be try to quantify the total size of that market and then understand is this something that we as an organization can figure out a way that we can find the staff find the space and be financially successful in doing it. I'm not thinking about, you know, making tons of money, but can we do this without losing tons of money? Because certainly, you know, no margin, no mission. So once we're able to figure all of those things out, we say, yeah, we really do think we're able to offer this service. Then I would look at what types of spaces might be required for those types of things. So of that list, uh, dental services was kind of the one outlier versus the others. Uh, so if I'm thinking of, you know, a dental operatory, you know, where I'm going to do x-rays and cleanings and so on and so forth, that space may be less useful for other types of services, whereas behavioral health space may be able to convert to uh, clinic space. And so looking at the amount of space, the types of spaces, and then if we were to suddenly get out of the service tomorrow or it went someplace else, could we repurpose those spaces? That's all part of a master plan in my mind, but it starts by understanding the total size of that market, what piece of it we think we might want to provide, and then how much space would we need to be able to provide that. Great, thank you so much. Um, how do you know when to cut services and downsize? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one. I think that definitely goes into uh, starting with the financial side of things, you know, do we have, are we consistently losing money? Do we not have the, the revenues to support the staff required for a particular service? Now I'll think of uh, the one that always gets picked on is obstetrics. Um, you know, do we have enough deliveries that this makes sense for our market? But then we also need to ask that question that says, if we don't do it, what happens to the moms in our community and where might they have to go? Uh, again, it is our job to figure out how to best provide health care for the community, not to provide all health care for the entire community. So when I think about making a decision to cut a service, I start by trying to think about, again, what the size of that market is and if I'm not doing it, who might? But also, do I need to make an investment in that service? If I needed, if my the space I was providing obstetrics in was out of compliance, you know, and the building itself was quite terrible, and I needed new space in order to do that, would I want to be investing $3 million in a project that loses me $2 million every year? Uh, those become the, the tough decisions to, to have. I think yeah. they're very much part of the strategic planning, community health needs assessment discussions. Absolutely. Kind of plays into the, the next question. Why do a ma in my just if I'm putting it all together right in my mind, why do a master plan if you aren't able to afford to build something yet? Yeah, so I mean it's interesting. I think that so often, you know, if we believe we are going to be here into the future, and the future is undefined, but let's say we believe we're gonna be here forever. 
uh, and right now our economics tell us we can't afford to do something, every single thing that we do, every emergency we have, and we replace this roof or we replace that door, all of those things in an ideal world would go towards something better in the future. And so when I think about a master plan, it is as important, I shared this earlier, to know where not to invest. You know, this is a building that we know we're going to get out of in five years when we have a better financial performance. So let's not invest in the roof over there. Let's patch it instead of replace it. Um, is there an opportunity to make smaller incremental improvements, but that are tied to a bigger vision? And then, you know, think about if today I can't afford to do the project, but I've got a donor community or a foundation community or a tax base that we may be able to access in terms of some of the needs for our market. If we can point to those needs in a way that touches people, those may be opportunities for us to get you know, some of the initial funding to do some of those projects. Thank you. Uh, I do have a question for you too. If you could explain a little more about what you mean by fractional rooms don't work. Yeah, so um, the idea of when I'm doing a calculation and I say, um, I've got, uh, well, I'm trying to do the math in my head. Uh, I've got 13,000 ED treatment uh, procedures. Uh, I've got 13,000 ED visits coming in my facility and my math looked at that and said, uh, I needed to have 1,250 visits per room per year, that would tell me for those 13,000, I need 10 point something ED treatment spaces. So I need 10 definitely, but the point something, I don't want to be the person that's in half a room. Um, you know, it's the, you'd have to round up to 11 or you round down to 10. If we round down to 10, we have to think about operational improvements to make that math work or we move it up to 11 rooms and now we've got excess capacity. So it's important just the the point is when I'm thinking about dividing some number of visits per room per year by my projected volume, it is likely to come up with something that's got a decimal point. And that decimal point needs to be dealt with oftentimes in a rounding up way, but sometimes it could be addressed by changing my throughput assumptions so that I'm more efficient and I'm able to round down. Okay, thank you so much. Um, another question, if you do have questions, go ahead and put those in. Uh, we, we do have a couple minutes left. John, uh, next one that came in, when is the best time to engage an architectural team to execute the project? Uh, so I would say it is really, really best practice to keep good relationships with your local architects, uh, particularly those that are competent in healthcare design. And I know that's a challenge oftentimes in rural communities, uh, because the architect, you know, there aren't a ton of healthcare architects that might be in smaller communities throughout the country. They tend to be located more in urban areas. Um, and so the person that ends up doing the uh, the local healthcare project also did the church and they did the auto dealership and they may have done the school. And that's not to say they don't know healthcare, but it's really important to understand what they understand in healthcare. Um, recognizing competency in design and execution of a building doesn't necessarily equal competency in planning of a building. So there are lots of codes that say, you know, it must be X square feet, it must have four light switches, it must have this, it must have that. And folks can be competent in reading through all of that, but there aren't necessarily codes for the planning of a hospital. What should be near what, what makes the most sense? And so engaging an architectural team to do that is also important. And I'd say that one of the biggest thing is, you know, architects and having spent a lot of time inside of a firm, you know, we are, architects were historically very good at order taking. You want six of these, four of those, nine of those, 10 of those, great, I'm gonna write that up, I'll draw it and you will discuss it. Uh, planning for a facility is not the time for order taking. Actually, I want a partner that's gonna challenge me. I want someone that's gonna push back and say, I know you think you want this and you think you need this, but the math doesn't support that. Or here's how you should go uh, in a different way. Great, thank you so much. Um, I am gonna turn it back over to you for any closing remarks. Please remember there uh, is a recording that will be coming and you can reach out to John 
This information is on the screen if you'd like the slides or have any other questions that we did not uh, address today. John, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. No, th thanks, Cody. Um, I'm very happy to present. I do encourage everyone that, that sat through uh, today, and if you were part of the strategic planning uh, session a couple of weeks ago, please uh, come back tomorrow to talk about the financing side of things. Uh, Brian is a fantastic presenter and uh, probably the smartest uh, person that I know in this space. Uh, so making things a reality, even when it seems like times might be dark, uh, that seems to be Brian's specialty. So uh, thank you all for your time. Please let me know if there are slides you would be interested in, and I will happily send them over. This is a larger slide deck than uh, the strategic planning slide deck, so it may be something where I need to send some links in order to have you uh, pull them down from somewhere, but we'll work through that. Just send me your interest and I will get them out. Uh, certainly my email and phone number is on the screen right now. Uh, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, John. Thank you for all the information today. And thank you everyone for joining us. Yes, please join us tomorrow. Brian's got a great presentation. I just, uh, before we got on today, was speaking with him and got a chance to, to look at it. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Um, don't forget to fill out that survey at the end, please. And everyone have a wonderful, safe day. I hope everyone's staying cool. It's a wonderful 100 degrees here where I am in Illinois today. So uh, we'll talk to you all next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye, John.